dear Heavenly Father, love you so much. Thankful for the opportunity to be here today. And uh, Lord, we need you. Desperate. We heard it in the song. We heard it in Sabbath school. We see it all around us, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You're good. Um, this little song we sang a little bit ago, Jesus I Come, Out of the Depths of Ruin Untold, Into the Peace of Thy Sheltering Fold, Out of My Sin and Into Thyself, Jesus I Come. <coughs> Actually, I'd like to go back to that old thing that we used to have because this is terrible. I don't like this. I don't like it holding it either, but it's better than that. Because I feel like I'm, you know, like a cow in a barn. can't move. Um, anyways, uh, what, is, what do we name this little talk today? Who is in control? Who's in control? Who is in control? Okay. Um, this crazy world we live in. Sabbath school, we were talking about, you know, people wearing masks. A lot of people wear masks today. Maybe even some of us in here are wearing masks. You know, what is real? What isn't real? You sit down and watch a Hollywood movie, right? And, uh, they want to capture some guy and place somebody else, they put a mask on him, right? And they have this stuff to synthesize voices and make it sound like the real person. And You see it in the movies, right? I mean, if you watch movies, you've seen it. They take this guy away and put this guy here and nobody knows. Nobody. Okay. So if they can do that in Hollywood, do you think they can do that in real life? Do you think it maybe it does happen? Do you think there's a lot of deception going on in the world? You know? Who who is the devil gonna come as? What is he gonna look like? Yeah. He's not gonna come to impersonate Christ, right? Spirit of Prophecy tells us that he's coming to personate Christ. There is a difference. You realize that, right? Impersonation is when you just pretend to be somebody and everybody laughs. Like I'm Rich Little up here pretending to be Ronald Reagan and speak and sound just like him, right? But to personate somebody, that's a whole different matter. I, I'm deceiving you into believing you, it believing to you that I am somebody else. That I'm really not. So I ask you, who, who is in control? I mean, the world has totally lost its mind. The lie is the truth, and the truth is a lie. So, if, if you're going to tell the truth, what's going to happen to you? What are they going to do? If the lie, if the truth has become a lie, if you tell the truth, then you're made out to be a liar and you have to be destroyed. Do you understand that? Do you see where we're going here rapidly fast? This is pretty scary stuff. I mean, the world is just nuts. There's a lot of I'm way too busy at work. Um, I'm wearing like three or four hats, doing way too many jobs, stressed out unbelievably. And um, got to get some good people in there to help me out because it's I'm just over. It's too much. And uh, you know, we all have God-given personalities, right? Um, some of us are strong in one area and then we're weak in another area. And that's just the way it is. You know, that's how it's made. So uh, we have to work on things. You know, um, 
a visual demonstration would be like a race car. If I build a race car, I want to build a race car that turns left really well, right? Because that means you go left. I'm not really too concerned about going right. So if I get that race car off the track of its normal thing, I may have to go right. It's not going to go right so well, right? So we're all different. And that's not a bad thing. We should celebrate our differences, but realize where you're weak and we need to get shored up, right? Jesus is strong in all areas. He's never failed, okay? Um, I believe somebody read today John 14, 6, right here, Miss Mary Jane. Jesus said, I am the way, because there is no other. He is the truth. Solid. He's the word of God. God only accepts absolute perfection. Okay, brothers and sisters? None of us or anybody that's ever lived does not measure up to that. But Jesus Christ did. And he did it for you and for me and for every soul that has ever lived. Okay? But with that being said, we need help. Don't we? We all need help. So where do you go to get your help? How much time do you spend there looking for help? I tell you what, I don't spend enough time. Because I get pretty upset with some people. Daytona, where I work, is a place that has a lot of people that um, how do you say this in a politically cool, correct way? Um, strange people. Just say it that way, okay? I'm going to put it right down there on the bottom shelf. And uh, some of them are, you know, I have to go out there and they're right, I mean, my window's right here and my desk and people do these things right here in front of me. And I'm um, like, I have to run people off sometimes. I don't have a problem with that. I'm okay with that. Um, with my personality, I'm a type A. I'm very forward. If it's here, it's coming right out. Um, I'm not real sympathetic with everybody. I don't feel a lot of pain, people's pain. Now, God has put me with my little daughter over there, Kyla, who has that gift beyond reckoning? Little? She could walk in. She could you hear that. She could walk into a room, okay, of 200 people, and there's somebody in that place that's hurting, and she will go Amen. right to them, Amen. and she will feel their pain. I have seen it. I don't know how it's even possible, and she'll just stand right there in front of them and start bawling, and they hug, and this person all of a sudden feels better. <coughs> Kyla goes away okay. And I don't understand that. That's way out of my realm. I can't do that stuff. But this gal, just Friday, 20 feet from my desk, I knew she was in trouble. She was cracked out, I'm sure. But I knew that I had to just not go out there and run her off. Some told me just there'll be a few minutes and she'll be out of here. But she's right there, completely undressing, 20 feet from my window, in front of the whole world. And um, when she did that, she got her other clothes on and spent a few more minutes doing whatever they do when they're on all them drugs. And then she left. How do you help people like that? What do you do? That's it. I mean, what else? What do you do? I mean, there's mental illness. I remember when I was a young boy, there was mental facilities everywhere. We don't, I mean, they closed them all down. Just throw the people out. 
Drugs are the answer to everything today, aren't they? Just take this drug, take that drug. What do drugs do? They all have side effects. They all hurt more than they help most of the time. I'm not saying that you can't, there isn't stuff that people have to have, but, you know, God's way doesn't always work like that, super fast. But it's the best way. And it doesn't have side effects. Salvation is a side effect. <laughs> there you go. Salvation is a side effect. But anyways, who is in control? Because you know what? It sure don't seem like God's in control, does it? Devil's on an awful long leash down here. And he's allowed to run pretty wild. And things seem to be getting crazier and crazier every day. So let's talk about some people here. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew 10. Um, when you get there, just say amen. Okay, Matthew 10, and uh, let me begin, spilled water all over myself, sorry about that. I had to buy this soup when I wanted to bury my grandmother a few years ago, it was a Catholic funeral, and the priest spoke in Latin, and the only words I heard was hocus pocus. But I can barely get these pants on now. I'm going to suck my belly all the way in just to button them things. Thank God it hasn't broken yet. Because I've worn them about three times since my belly's been like this. It's all that stress. All right, starting Matthew 10, verse 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey. Neither two coats, neither shoes, nor staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. What, what do you make of this? Is this happening? Are we going out like this? Preaching and saying the kingdom of God is at hand? Shouldn't we be? Right? If we were, we'd probably be being persecuted. Amen. Right? In today's world. I'm going to keep reading here. In verse 11, and, and into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. So, so what's happening here? These guys are committed to the gospel, right? This is what they do. They're dug in. We would call them today missionaries, right? Is that what they're supposed to be doing? Right? Is that what you're going to do, Travis? Right. Good man. And whosoever, in verse 14, whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be, there, be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And why, why does this happen? scourge you in their synagogues? What were we talking about in Sabbath school? What was, what was happening? The woman was riding a beast? 
and in Revelation 14, that's where we were getting that from, right? So what, what is this woman riding the beast? This is the church riding the state, right? So who's in control? <laughs> Satan. Amen. Yeah. That's the deal. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, when they deliver you up, and some of us here will be delivered up. Take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in, the same, in that same hour what ye shall speak. What do you make of that? Who's in control there? Hmm. So does that mean we go willy-nilly, what the Japanese call mushin, no mind? Is that, the, is that what it means? No, it means we go studied up and full of faith. And we, we, we put all the chips on the table, so to speak, and let Jesus take care of things. Don't, don't take any thought for myself or what needs to be done. We just dig in with our relationship with Jesus Christ. We study. We know Him. Right? We have this wonderful relationship. And then we can walk with our head high. It's like the guy who works hard every week. He doesn't have to go like this to get his paycheck, right? He can look his boss square in the eye. You follow me? Thank God we didn't have to work for anything. Jesus gave us all of it. This is a super deal, right? You can't get a better deal in the, anywhere in the universe. He says, give me all your sin, and I give you all my righteousness. Whew. There ain't better people. You can't get one. Amen. So why would you hold on to something that stinketh when he's going to give you something righteous? It's a good question for all of us. Verse 20. For it is not that for it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that how Jesus spent every moment? The Bible says that Jesus said, these words that I speak to you, they're not my words. They're my Father's words, right? Amen. So this is how He spent His time. Do you think that he wants to allow us to do the same thing? We started this out with heal the sick, clean, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Do you think it's going to end the same way it started? And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child. Can you imagine that? The father, his own child. And the children shall rise up against their parents. Now I can see that. And cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Are we hated? You're not hated yet like you're going to be if you keep hanging on to Jesus. Because the world has literally lost its mind and it's getting worse every day. I want to read you a little something from the Great Controversy. Um, page 111. Death at the beginning of his imprisonment would have been a mercy 
in comparison with the terrible sufferings which he had undergone, but now weakened by illness, by the rigors of his prison house, and the torture of anxiety and suspense, separated from his friends, and disheartened by the death of Huss, Jerome's fortitude gave way. Guys, listen closely to this. This is a giant, and his fortitude gave way. Okay? And he consented to submit to the council. He pledged himself to adhere to the Catholic faith and accepted the action of the council in condemning the doctrines of Wycliffe and Huss, expecting, however, the holy truce which they had taught. But this expedient, Jerome, endeavored to silence the voice of conscience and escape his doom. You hear that? You think it's possible for you and I? If we're not prayed up and we're not stayed up with Jesus at any moment, you're done. Amen. You follow me? Any moment, you're Amen. done. We are no match for the enemy. But in the solitude of his dungeon, he saw more clearly what he had done. He thought of the courage and fidelity of Huss, and in contrast, pondered upon his own denial of the truth. He thought of the divine master who he had pledged himself to serve, and who for his sake endured the death of the cross. Before his retraction, he had found comfort amid all his sufferings. Did you hear that? He had found comfort in all his sufferings before his retraction. In the assurance of God's favor, but now remorse and doubt tortured his soul. Did you hear that? That's about the way it is with the devil, you know? He'll encourage somebody to do come some kind of sin like this stuff that's going on with guns and children being shot in schools and whatever. And he'll encourage these people, yeah, go ahead, go in there, kill them, shoot them up, blah, blah, blah. And then you do whatever you do that he had you do. And then he's like, look what you did. Why don't you just shoot yourself? This is who the devil is. He's a liar. The enemy of God, of love and righteousness and truth. He promised you all these things and leave you wasted. Amen. For a moment. A moment of what? Earthly pleasure, whatever it is. He knew that still other retractions must be made before he could be at peace with Rome. Do you hear that? You start going down that road, you go further and further. The path upon which he was entering could end only in complete apostasy. At least he had the fortitude to realize the nth degree. His resolution was taken. To escape a period of suffering, he would not deny his Lord. Soon he was again brought before the council. His submission had not satisfied his judges. Their thirst for blood, wetted by the death of Huss, clamored for fresh victims. Only by an unreserved surrender of the truth could Jerome preserve his life. But he determined to avow his faith and follow his brother martyr to the flames. He renounced his former rec recantation and as a dying man, solemnly required an opportunity to make his defense. Fearing the effect of his words, the prelates insisted that he should merely affirm or deny the truth of the charges brought against him. Can you imagine what it must have been like to have been there? Jerome protested against such cruelty and injustice. You have held me shut up 340 days in a frightful prison, he said, in the midst of filth, noisomeness, no, noisomeness, stench, and the utmost want of everything. 
You then bring me out before you, and lending an ear to my mortal enemies, you refuse to hear me. If you be really wise men and the lights of the world, take care not to sin against justice. As for me, I'm only a feeble mortal. My life is but a little importance. And when I exhort you to deliver an unjust sentence, I speak less for myself than for you. Wow. You hear that? Let me read that again. If you be really wise men and the lights of the world, take care not to sin against justice. As for me, I am only a feeble mortal. My life is but a little importance. And when I exhort you not to deliver an unjust sentence, I speak less for myself than for you. Did you hear it that time? His request was finally granted. In the presence of his judges, Jerome kneeled down and prayed that the, that the divine spirit might control his thoughts and words. That should be all of our prayers. That he might speak nothing contrary to the truth or unworthy of his master. To him that day was fulfilled the promise of God to the first disciples. Ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. The words of Jerome excited astonishment and admiration, even in his enemies. Does it sound like that's the way you remember Jesus when he spoke and his enemies tried to trip him up? What did they say? Never did a man ever speak like this. Amen. For a whole year, he had been enamored in a dungeon, unable to read or even see, in great physical suffering and mental anxiety. Okay? Now, I said I'm overworked, but I'm not that bad. <laughs> All right, so what am I saying to myself? I got no excuse. That's what I'm saying. I always try to teach my people to listen to what people don't say. Right? Always listen to what they don't say. Yet his arguments were presented with as much clearness and power as if he had undistributed opportunity for undisturbed opportunity for study. He pointed his hearers to the long line of holy men who had been condemned by unjust judges. In almost every generation have been those who, while seeking to elevate the people of their time, have been reproached and cast out, but who in later times have been shown to be deserving of honor. Christ himself was condemned as a male factor at an unrighteous tribunal. At his re retraction, Jerome has ascended to the justice of the sentence condemning Huss. He now declared his repentance and bore witness to the innocence and holiness of the martyr. I knew John Huss from his childhood, he said. He was a most excellent man, just and holy. He was condemned notwithstanding his innocence. I also am ready to die. I will not recoil before the torments that are prepared for me by my enemies and false witnesses who will one day have to render an account of their impostures before the great God, whom nothing can deceive. In self-reproach for his own denial of truth, Jerome continued, of all the sins that I have committed since my youth, none weighs so heavily upon my mind and cause me such poignant remorse as that which I committed in this fatal place when I approved of this inquisitive sentence rendered against Wycliffe and the holy martyr John Huss, my master, yes, I confessed it from my heart and declared with honor that I disgracefully quailed when, though a dread of death, I condemned their doctrines. 
I therefore supplicate Almighty God to design to pardon me my sins in this one in particular, the most heinous of all. Pointing to his judges, he said firmly, you condemn Wycliffe and Huss not for having shaken the doctrine of the church, but simply because they, they branded with reprobation the